Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to another episode of Lack of Focus, episode 35, Return from Batu. I am your belated host, one Mr. Enhorn, along with my producer extraordinaire, one Mr. Chris Sheriff. Er, Chris, how's it going, my friend? Oh, good. Thanks, Ed. It's good to have you back. I'm so happy. Uh, it's been a rough week. We'll kind of get into that. Um, we've got a few things going to go over. We're going to make this kind of a short, ca social, casual one, obviously, because I am back from Galaxy's Edge. I got to build some cool toys and have a cool experience there. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I know it's not X-Wing related. Um, there is some stuff in the news. Of course, there is some epic news that I'm going to want to talk about. Uh, a few other things that popped up and then this crazy ship that we might spend a couple of minutes on. I know there's some <laughs> other better podcasts that are out there that have really kind of broken it down. Uh, and that's really going to be kind of about it. Kind of about about it. Do you still want to try to get a game in today? By the way, Chris. Um, we'll see what time we finish. I've got to head into work for some stuff today, but we can try. Okay. I mean, worst case scenario, we can try it tonight too. But yeah, it might yeah. work better for me. Maybe we'll see. Oh, even better. All right. So let's dive right into it. Um, let's get the let's get the elephant out of the room. Uh, something happened two weeks ago that has never happened in the history of podcasting with these guys that i did i have been broadcasting with chris and sean and chad and a whole bunch of other friends on x-wing for years and something happened for the first time last week i missed a show that does not happen um we usually bump in time like we have an ability the flexibility and the schedule to kind of catch it on a saturday or a sunday um, but because of my work trip to San Diego and we're going through some crazy amount of work preparing for an inspection, I simply didn't have any time. So I do want to applaud Chris and thank him and say thanks, Chris, for, for towing in the show line because obviously he had to run the show solo and I do apologize for not being able to make it. That is uh, unfortunately uh, what happened. Sometimes. I recognize it's totally a, a first world problem. Like, yeah, I had work and I had to work from home. Um, I get it. I'm a developer. I don't do a ton of work from home kind of thing. Like normally I can get my stuff done in any hour a day, but to be able to like, I was even during the convention when I went to San Diego, uh, I was doing work in the hotel room to the point where I actually had to leave certain seminars to just lock myself in a room and work for 10 hours straight. So I'm under a high amount of stress for work, but the uh, inspection is coming up um, this week as we're recording. It starts tomorrow um, and it's all going to be over. And then I can finally, finally, <laughs> finally go back to doing my normal job and drop the stress levels back down to normal levels. So I do want to apologize for missing last week. Chris, you did a fantastic job taking over. Thank you. Uh, I uh, I realized that I can talk for like an hour uninterrupted about X-Wing and it, it's, <laughs> um, it's fine. It's all fine. Absolutely I can't do. even remember what I spoke about. I'm pretty sure I gave advice on like trying to be good at the game, but... Who who can say? I have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. You don't, we do, we've done so many shows anymore. I, I remember I truncated the silence on it and took out all of the gaps in my speech because I didn't have anyone to riff with and bounce ideas off of. And I think I shortened the show by about eight minutes from the video version to the audio version. Oh, wow. So if you watch the video, there's eight minutes worth of me just not talking. <laughs> no that's spread out over an hour so it's like a couple of seconds here and a couple of seconds yeah. there no, it, just, it always makes me laugh it's my favorite feature when now i'm doing the editing now is seeing how much silence i cut out he has he's been giving us statistics too and seeing how much in, in uh, gap in between is going on <laughs> all right but let's get to the fun part that came from my trip so the upside for going out to san diego uh and spending four beautiful days trapped in uh hotels and a resort uh, was that on the Thursday, we ended the, all the last seminar ended at 12 o'clock on Thursday and San Diego is about 90 minutes away from Anaheim. And we decided to drive out to Galaxy's Edge. I mean, there's Disneyland in and around it, but the real reason why I went to go was to uh, Galaxy's Edge. Um, I've heard some things about Galaxy's Edge, but for me, it was an extraordinarily immersive experience. It really was. Um, there are parts of Disneyland that just looks like Disney. It's, you know, it's dripping with Disney iconography. But as you get closer to uh, Galaxy's Edge, the lamppost chase change, you start seeing arabesque written on the walls and all the signs. And then all of a sudden, boom, that you're in um, Batu. You're in a world from Star Wars. You get to see like all everything is written in arabesque there. Everything looks in the, the design that you would think of of all the sets that you've ever seen from any Star Wars movie. The only, uh, so let's get all the pluses out of the way. Um, there are life-size recreations of A-Wings and X-Wings. Disappointingly, it was a T-70, not T-65. It's the only complaint I'll have on those, but they are. They're life-size. Um, I don't know if Chris is 
could probably pa- um, pillage my Facebook page if he really wanted to to kind of see some of the photos. Um, there's a life-size Tide silencer, and of course the 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 piece de resistance. It, there is a uh, a full-sized replica of the Millennium Falcon, which is absolutely amazing to see in person. Um, not recognizing how big that ship really is. And then you kind of get into the things that you can do in Galaxy's Edge. And I think this is kind of where there is maybe a tone, <clears throat> excuse me, of a downside. There's not a ton to do there. There's oodles of shopping that you can do in all of the, the Star Wars motif. And we'll kind of get to some of the shopping that I did. But there's one ride, which is uh, the ability to, a smuggler's run, which is the ability to pilot the Millennium Falcon. Um, it is a six-person ride. There are two pilots in the left and right seats. There are two gunners and there are two engineers. Um, I, of course, got to take the uh, Han Solo pilot seat, <laughs> which was amazing. Um, and there's, like, I guess, a 25 scenarios that go through there. They're like, so they're all different every time you run it. Um, we had a good time. It was oodles of fun. Uh, the whole thing kind of shakes and moves as you're going around. It's kind of, if anyone ever did Star Tours at um, Disney World or Disneyland, it's similar to that, except you have a little bit more control over what's going on. Because, I mean, you can bounce the Falcon around and not hit off, hit off a of rocks, and then the thing will jerk as you're going through it. But it looked like the Millennium Falcon cockpit. I mean, it looked identical to everything that I've ever seen from all the set pieces. The only thing that was missing, no dice. <laughs> I did, It was one of the first things I said, what, no dice? <laughs> there are no them. dice in. Um, and then that's kind of about it. I mean, you can walk around, you can take some photos, and of course we'll get to uh, this wonderful thing I have sitting on the desk. Um, I did go through and build one of the lightsabers. I went through and built power and control. Uh, there are four lightsabers that you can build at the uh, at the the shop. Um, when picking them, you you basically get one of two options. So you you pick the style of lightsaber you're going to build, and then they give you like two subsets. So you kind of like take all your favorite pieces. What I will say about this lightsaber, I have held a lot, and I do mean a lot, being the Star Wars nerd I am. Uh, lightsabers in my day, this is by far the highest quality one I think I've ever touched. Um, it's heavy for starters. Um, let's get that one out of the way. All the pieces are uh, milled in metal. So, I mean, there is a plastic component beneath it, but the rest of this is all metal. So there is a ton of weight here. And um, the lightsaber blade, every time you've ever seen a lightsaber, you hit a button, it turns on, it turns off. Not this one. And I don't know how well this is going to pick up on camera. This one progresses up the blade when you turn it up and down the blade as you turn it off. So, of course, I went with uh, my man Mace Windu, and I went with uh, the purple one, which is uh, like they op- in in the shop. They give you the option for the red, the green, the blue, and the purple. I chose purple because Mace Windu is one of my favorite characters. And then whenever you de uh, ignite it, it actually progresses down. So I always thought that was kind of cool. Now I've seen reviews of these things online, and people take these with those combat ones, like from Saber Forge, and they compare very well. You can do uh, lightsaber combat with them. They're a little bit heavier, but you absolutely can do them. So, like, these are kind of safe to, to bang around if you, if you want to. The other thing that I did in relation to shopping, there are two other secret uh, kyber crystals that you do not have access to when building the lightsaber, and that is the uh, the clear kyber crystal and the yellow kyber crystal for Pong Kloon. And um, I'm, the only reason I can think of, aside from Ahsoka Tano, is like some of the trainers that may have had the clear lightsaber, but I'm thinking Ahsoka when I thought about these. Yeah. So, of course, I went out and bought the uh, additional Kyber crystals. So, to get geeky and technical for just a bit, all of the colors are programmed into the lightsaber to start off with. And the Kyber crystals themselves are just an RF chip that just, whenever you put it inside the lightsaber, it knows what RGB code to fire off to fire the color. So, technically, your lightsaber can be every color. So now I want to go out and buy all of them. <laughs> yeah, as long as you buy, as long as you give Disney the money, you know, exactly. Gotta pay the most, man. Exactly. And so you know what? You know, I say that and don't care. Yep, I said the exact same thing. So because so at Disney they're fifteen bucks a piece, and they're like, "You're really going to pay fifteen bucks?" And I'm like, "Yes, yes, yes I spent yes, two hundred. I, I spent two hundred dollars on the lightsaber. You're darn right. I'm going to spend another thirty to make it." One of three colors. It's a literal embodiment of the Fry meme from Futurama. Exactly. Shut up and take like. <laughs> Shut up and take my money. <laughs> just do what you just, want, man. That's fine. Take the money. Take it. So, I know we did other things at Disney too. We ran the rode the Indiana Jones ride. We rode uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. We did a couple of, of other rides while we were there. But for me, once I got through with the tour of Star Wars, everything else was kind of great. But we only had a few hours uh, to do it. But I got to do all of the things I wanted to do. 
Um, I will uh, say that uh, the Millennium Falcon at night, whenever you're kind of coming up on it, because we built the lightsabers, we went around, we did some shopping. Uh, we did eat in a restaurant there where you can actually eat off of the wing of an X-Wing, which is what I did. Um, and then it started getting dark, and I'm like, ooh, I'm going to go get pictures of it at night. And it is very impressive with the way they did the lighting there. Very cool. Very fun experience. I definitely enjoyed it and highly recommend it. Yeah. I I did check to see how long of a drive it would be to see if I could come down when you were there, but I think it's just not doable in one day. It would have to be a two day there, one day staying there, and then two days back. And that oh, was a little you, bit too much. That, I'd, uh, yeah, absolutely. That would have been fun. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm I really want to go. It's just trying to line up um, like how old Evie's going to be, and I'm probably going to wait until the. Uh, the new the second ride opens in like january or february next year i think it is yeah but I, i'm gonna do the um, anaheim one as well so I, <clears> it's just easier to get to like so i can kind of drive it from calgary oh. yeah so obviously they're gonna be opening up in disney world too that like i said if i had had a criticism once you've ridden the millennium falcon once you've built your lightsaber once you've kind of walked around and got a look and feel and maybe hung out at the tonto uh, at the the cantina that's it that's all there is. So for the casual Star Wars fan to the not really a Star Wars fan at all, it's probably not super impressive. For me, I was in my all my glory. Um, I had a ton of fun. Now, would I do it again? I don't know, because I've kind of done all this stuff. I mean, I might go back and build another lightsaber, perhaps. But beyond that, eh. you take the kits. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I, well, we want to do the thing. Florida one so I can kind of get the feel for both and I can tell you which one's better. Yeah, and that's you. If you're going to go with the kids, you do the whole Disney, you're going to Disney World, you're not going to Galaxy's Edge. I think. Right. I mean, I love Star Wars, but depending on my mood, I could probably be satisfied with a visit in like a half day thing. Just go, like I said, hit a couple of rides, build my lightsaber, play with droids, look around, take some photographs, and then, like I said, that's it. But Which equally, is exactly what I did. Yeah. I think you can go there and just like, try and interact with everything. And so I, I've seen little bits at the. You can try and queue up to get in the cantina and like, yeah, have that your Star Wars part... drinks. And... Okay, so for the record, um, with the ex Disneyland is a dry hole. There is no alcohol at all on site, with the exception of the cantina. Yeah. So if you are inclined that you're looking for a more adult beverage, that is the only place in all of Disneyland you can do it. And I did get blue milk, which is basically a blue fruity slushy for eight dollars. But damn it, I had blue milk, so I'm happy about it. Yeah, um, I can't remember. I've only ever been to Euro Disney. Obviously, growing up in Europe, um, obviously, and I. I can't, I remember I went at New Year's Eve, so we were drinking like champagne at New Year's Eve. I was only like fifteen or whatever, but it's France, so whatever you can drink. But um, exactly, there I can't are remember no legal if, ages. I can't remember if that was dry or not, or you know if he only had the champagne because it was New Year's Eve. I'll have to look it up. Uh, I didn't realize that Disneyland was a dry uh, a dry holiday. Neither did we. Um, so of course we <laughs> when disappointment. My, so it's interesting because it wasn't. It was me and my other um, my my boss went with me and my colleague Dave went with me. And of course, Dave and I are huge Star Wars fans. It's the reason why we wanted to go. My boss and uh, one of our other managers at work kind of just tagged along, like, "Oh yeah, we'll just go to Disneyland. Why not?" Kind of thing. It was almost like mom and dad were taking us, and <laughs> like we were like <laughs> running to all the rides. Yeah. Um, but they're the ones that were like, huh, I wonder if we can get an alcoholic beverage. And uh, my boss was talking to one of the security guards, and he told us that, that like, aside from the cantina, there's no alcohol at all. And the, my other manager, she was like, I thought this was the happiest place on earth. <laughs> 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 Apparently I, not, if you're I kind you of of alcohol to get through it. Thinking about it, I kind <clears> of <throat> get it. From the like, this is where you get to see like horrible, judgmental Chris coming out. You know <laughs> the, uh, especially the, the Florida resort and the uh, Florida man. The, the, the type of families you get taking the kids there, getting absolutely paralytic and just screaming <laughs> at the kids. It kind of ruins the atmosphere for everyone else. So yep, I get that. Totally yeah. get it. There you go. Those judgmental Chris comes out for a little snip. You get a little, you know, a little peek under a, a cover. A little taste. A little taste. Chris All hates right, so everyone. 
Yeah, so obviously that is what I've been doing. Um, again, I highly recommend. Uh, I know you can get these for like, like people are scalping these things for like four hundred bucks online. Not a chance. This thing is going to stay in my personal collection for a long time. Like even the Kyber crystals, like the the white one, apparently goes for like fifty bucks on eBay. I've seen it all over the place for like fifty bucks, and I'm like, I paid fifteen dollars on. Do you get to pick for cool? Because I read some more. I might, it might have been just a random post on Facebook. The random. When you if you buy just the crystals, and they are so when you build the lightsaber, you have your options for red, blue, green, or purple. Or I took the purple one. Mace Windu is one of my favorite characters, but obviously yeah. those are the standard ones. Yeah. When you go into the shop that has them, they are like as you said, completely random. These were the only two that were there, and we got there like they they had just restocked them when they got there. These were the only two. I was literally the next person in line as they were filling them up. I said, I want both of them. And then they were gone. So everybody else at Disneyland that day did not get it. Everything that I have read online is that they are sh very hard to come by, very hard to find. So I didn't get them for any intrinsic value, like going out and yeah. No, I want them because, damn it, I want a white lightsaber. <laughs> but So can you see that it's going to be white before you hand over money? Sure. Okay. So I was going to say, I don't know how well this is going to pick up on camera. Yeah, I can but... see it's a white cylinder thing. So the yellow one is obviously... Right. The yellow one. And so whenever you crack these open, these are the actual crystals that you put into the lightsaber. They're just, again, a plastic one, but they've got the RGB chip in there that tells you yeah. what color it is. So you can tell the difference between a white crystal and, crack this open, the yellow crystal, for example. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether it was going to be a, um, like a... A Pokeball oh. type thing where you, you've got to buy... Fit. Oh, there's my seventh blue crystal. Best buy oh, another one. Snap. Hope for a while. That would suck ass yeah. if they did that. No, I see where you're going. Yeah, no, I don't... It's not that way, obviously. Right. You know which ones you're getting. So, it's random what's on the shelf when you arrive at the store. Correct. And okay. the more common ones, the red, blue, and greens are always there. They didn't have... For example, they didn't have any purple on the shelf. Right. When I got there. I, I had a purple one because I built a purple one. And obviously the red, blues, and greens are far more common. I can get those for 20 bucks online. I'm going. To, what I'm eventually going to do is I'm just going to buy all six crystals so that I can build any lightsaber I want. What you need to do is figure out how to program the chip and just make one. It's funny you just said that because my son literally said the exact same thing. Because, again, I don't know how well this is going to come over on non-camera one, but basically it the lightsaber pulls right. off. Where the color is determined is the RGB code that gets sent to the tube itself. It is yeah. not... In other traditional lightsabers, there's like a light. It's, yeah, the light fills up from the yeah from the hilt back. <clears throat> exactly. That is not how this works. So it is quite literally the tube itself. All the colors are programmed into the tube. So you're right. If you wanted to, someone could figure out a way to program a new chip that would make it, you know, neon pink or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was fun. Oodles. All right. So I have monopolized a ton of it. That's obviously what I've been doing. I've not been doing any gaming at all because this whole work thing. I'm, thank God this is going to be over on Friday. So I will defer to Chris. Chris, I know you've been gaming. What have you been doing the last month? Um, I played a little bit of X-Wing, played a bit more Infinity. So I'll do the, the Chris is a moron story first, because that, those are always the best. So I wanted to Some try out the new... Favorites. <laughs> I wanted to try out the new Citadel like contrast paints properly. They've been out for a little while now. But I hadn't done like, a full project with them. And I had some um, Infinity miniatures just sat around that I had. I did a big clear out. I don't know if you can see behind me, like the way it's changed a little bit and trying to shift a lot of stuff that I'd not been using. And I couldn't bring myself to get rid of this Steel Phalanx army, which is like uh, all the um, like ancient Greek heroes and everything. So you've got like the Myrmidons and Achilles, but we're all like sci fi with like cool swords and like oh, power cool. armor and everything. And, I, and I've had them for like five years, just unbuilt, just sat, not doing anything. And they, I just couldn't bring myself to clear them out. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do, I'll paint these, I'll paint them all with contrast, and I get to do the play around with contrast paints and do something with this bloody army that's been sat there forever. Okay, so for someone who doesn't know what a contrast paint does, can you give a little brief blurb on how you would describe because it's not it is paint but it's designed yeah. for a specific purpose yeah so a general paint works obviously that it obscures the surface you painted onto uh, then you have shades which games workshop did a really good range of like the shading stuff where it's a really watery one so it goes deep into crevices 
and it, it, it's more like dark. a liquid that kind of puts uh, pigment into the corners to establish yeah. shadowing. Uh, a contrast paint's designed to kind of do both things at once, so you get uh, an obscuring color, but then it also seeps and goes darker into crevices. So theoretically, you can spray something white and then just use one color, and it'll give you three different shades, like a lighter version on the highlights, a standard version on the flat, and then a darker version in the crevices and the recesses. And theoretically, you can do one coat and done for your entire model, and <laughs> just, just like so, paint by numbers. Yeah, it, th- that's what it is. So I, again, for those who have never painted a miniature before, it's exactly as Chris described. It's base coat, shading, highlighting. It's three steps. And that's considered like the the entry level how to make a model look good other than like you painted it with melting crayons onto it. This is supposed to do it all in one and I'm a little skeptical that it's capable of doing that. Because it seems like a lot of things to be able to try to do with one single paint. I'm not going to pull up any pictures and stuff. I'm planning, I'll am i write an article. I think I posted some photos on my Instagram anyway, but um, I'll, I plan on doing a proper in-depth like review of them at some point once I get time. But I I, I tackled, I had 10 models, so I arranged a game for Tuesday night uh, with one of my friends, and then I'm like, okay, I've got five days to get this army done. And I did like the 11 models, I think it was, in about eight hours, including drying time. Um, and that, that wasn't really me rushing, I was pretty laid back just watching Critical Role on the in the background and stuff like that and just really getting into that one myself lately they're doing a really good job I, i've not watched the vox machina one but i really enjoying the mighty nine stuff so it's good um but yeah um, i got it all done and then got my stuff ready on tuesday turned up and was like all right tim i can't play because i left my models at home oh <laughs> so i was so sad tim uh, lives right around the corner from the store so we went and got some some of his models, so I just proxied them. But I was, I was planning on getting like photographs of my army on the table because I've never played a game of Infinity with a fully painted army. And I've been close it. where I've had like one model that I've just added into a list that I'd not done yet. But I was so sad. I was I, oh. so I I got everything together. They were all in the little case and all all good to go. And then I just left them in the house. And it's like a thirty five minute drive to the store from my house. Oh jeez, so, been that there, was fun. done that. I've absolutely <laughs> yeah. done that. Yeah. All right. So to to finish up the review though, so how did it cover? Or you didn't get a chance to try it? Um, I decided paint. Um, certain colors are really good. Certain colors are a little bit more awkward. Uh, the white only works, in my opinion, if you do it over an extreme white. So I've been using, not even the Korax Cor- white, which is Games Workshop's own one, I don't think is crisp enough. I've been using the Army Painter white, which yep. gives you a really, Pure it's more white. of a gloss type finish on the white, whereas in Korax white, it's fairly matte. And it works well with those kind of gloss finishes. It lets the, uh, the contrast medium flow properly. Um, and oh, it it just gives you like a a grayish tint to it, and then I would still go back and touch it up with uh, standard paint. I don't think you can achieve a level uh, if you know enough to ask the questions. I don't think you'd be happy with the results of just using contrast. I am curious though. So how does it? Because of course, one of my. Um... My Space Marine Army is, uh, this is totally non-X-Men related, <laughs> my Space Marine leader is the uh, the Legion of Steel, which of course I'm from the greater Pittsburgh area, it is the Steelers uh, yellow and black coloring. And what I found was the most difficult color to paint with, one of, is definitely yellow, because especially whenever you prime in black and you build it up, you have to go from a, a black to a brown and from a brown to a yellow to kind of get that shading into yeah. it so that you because trying to paint yellow over black it's latex paint it's like a, a screen door the black is going to bleed through so if you just do it that way you're putting multiple coats on to try to get that yellow out the best way to do it is to build it up from a lighter color to a darker color to get to the final color i'm curious as to how like i recognize that uh, games workshop comes with like the base spray paints you can just go boom there's yellow to start off with do you yeah. then put the contrast over it? Because it might um, be... So, you could use contrast over any 
base paint, but it does work better with the two contrast primers and the, the army painter ones, I think would be okay. I wouldn't advise using like the Games Workshop yellow and then putting the contrast yellow over it. I don't know what that effect would be like. Again, I'm still, I'm only about halfway through the amount of detail I want to try doing for my proper full review of them. But and their contrast, um, their contrast um, primers are black and white. I would assume. No, it, it's um, a grey and a bone color. Ooh, uh, the con uh, the contrast specific primers because it's you need to use the light, so you can't use contrast paints over black because it doesn't do anything because it's a translucent. It's like trying right. to put a shade <laughs> over black. Um, Although some yeah. people try, yeah. Um, but never good. I want my I think. black to be blacker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another tangent. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to put call ahead to this because there's so many tangents. But yeah, um, I think you could do a decent job. The contrast black is one of my favorites. It's my new way of painting weapons. So I used to do um, I used to do a gray, then a hi- a gray highlight, a dry brush, and then a black wash just to give you that kind of matte, that gunmetal black type effect so you're now not a I'd, fan of the metallics paints at all then um not because like bulk metal is painting. like one of my favorites <laughs> yeah so i don't really do um metallics on my infinity stuff it's all i don't do non-metallic metals per se uh, okay i just uh, don't that's where it. i was going was where you're going the non-metallic metals uh i have done the, the non-metallic metals in the past but it's not something i do a lot of um if i'm doing like a sword on a fancy model i'll use metallics um a lot of um, like armor and stuff, I just use metallics. But the, a really good thing you can do with a contrast, and this will be my final point on it, is if you do a nice silver, um, you can then put a blue over it and have like, a blue tinted. Or so I did. I did like a, a blue commission. Wash, you mean? Yeah, but yeah. it do, does all the shading and stuff as well because it's contrast paints. So I did it. Um, it was a it was a commission for a guy who had these bi- this female biker gang and they were all in like big choppers. So I did all of them silver and then did like a yellow metallic and uh, a blue metallic and a red metallic. So you had these like chrome effect. Well, that's um, awesome. Yeah, well, it was pretty cool. But yeah, they're good fun to use. Interesting. I don't know that it would replace my actual painting. And I, I, it's not going to be my go to paints. But I'll finish this project and then let you know. We'll so the ones that always uh, come up with those is like, how well would it do for speed painting? Like there, there are those that are just trying. So the good tournaments require a certain level of painting for everyone. Like everyone needs to be painted. It needs to be painted to X level to be able to get yeah. points. The three colors based. The three color um, based minimum. If you're speed painting an army, what would you say? Yes. Yay or nay? Because that's kind of where the whole army painter system came yeah. in in the so first place. If I'm speed painting an army, I don't really know that it's much of an improvement if a normal person who's not done as because i've spent like five years now training myself to paint quicker so i i did i think i i timed myself painting a um oh a dnd figure for a friend i took a photograph on instagram at like twelve thirty three. And by one o'clock, uh, by two o'clock, it was finished, dried, based, and, and varnished. Oh wow! And that was with me painting the cloak the wrong color, having to soak all the paint up, reprime it, uh, rebase it, and then paint it again. Oh jeez! So I can do a twenty-eight mil figure, that single figure, in between half an hour and ninety minutes, depending on detail levels and stuff. You're way beyond me, but. <laughs> So, like, contrast doesn't really make that much faster. But if you're sitting and down, like, painting for the first time, contrast will make your painting quicker. Good. Because, again, that was kind of the whole deal with the army painter system was that you would spray paint one color, you dip, you highlight, and base, and you're done. You can do a whole yeah. army in a weekend kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I, I do think it'll be good, but it's definitely what, uh, what you're looking for type thing. So we'll see. Cool. So we're only 30 minutes in and haven't spoken a bit about X-Wing at all. We've talked some Star Wars, but that's okay. Well, I can kind of tie us into one of the topics you said we're going to talk about, because I did play a couple of games with Sunfak, and uh, I don't have I played against him yet. The Scourge of Second Edition Sunfak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I don't know. 
Yeah. You're, you're going to have to sell me on that one. Cause all right, so when we, you had sent me messages while I was away in San Diego and I was like, I started to look at the card and I started looking at some of the, the flack that was coming from this card. And there was a big part of me that was like, okay, yeah, it's good, but it's going to be 90 points in two, in two months. And then nobody's ever going to fly it again. And so I'll, 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 I'll put a pin in that. Because okay. that's one of my only almost <clears throat> rants on Sunfac, which I don't really want to get too. Uh, so yeah. I, one of the things that happened whilst I was going into this is um, I put a poll up on the um, on the Facebook page about does negativity from podcast drive a community, or does negativity in the community drive a podcast? Yeah, I saw that, and it was pretty close. But I think it was like. 59% or something that the community is negative and that's why podcasts are negative, not the other way around. Which I I, I kind of lean more on the responsibility of podcasts to be more positive, but that's because I'm an idealist, you know? Well, it, it's interesting that you say that because that was kind of my reaction as well. I'm like, okay, yeah, so this thing's a little bit broken, but because I am so far removed from competitive X-Wing, I don't care. Yeah, and like, that, okay, yeah, that ship's a little difficult to deal with. I, Let's just I'm not glad fly that, that we both else. share that space. Uh, like, it's one of the I'm, things I love about this version of the show yeah. is that we are no longer in that headspace of "Oh my god, this is so broken. The game's broken. I'm never going to play it again." No, I'm still going to keep playing X Wing. I'm just not going to fly that ship. Like, if some, if I turn up to game night on Friday, I'll play against Sunfuck. Then my second game, I'm not playing against Sunfuck again. Yes. Like, if everyone's, I I'll just not play. I don't, you know. You two can play each other. It's okay. You can have a sun fuck off. I don't mind. But you know, I don't mind playing it like one out of three games at a casual night. If I'm playing at a tournament and every game's against sun fuck, that's fine because I'm probably running sun fuck as well because it's a tournament. So you opt into that competitive kind of right, spirit. Exactly. So. But yeah, I I don't think the sky is falling. I don't think. Um, the the wheels have come off two point oh. I'm not, not even close. Not I'm even not close. happy a hundred percent with where Sun Fact lives because for purely, I don't think he's necessarily overpowered when you consider that in six months' time we can rebalance him points wise. The problem I have is similar to what we were talking about last time we both recorded. I think where we we're talking about punishing one and how it gets stupid before it gets balanced. Like, how cheap yeah, does it have to be for you to take? Yeah, and I think Sunfak is the same. He, he gets that expensive that you just don't take him before he gets to be in a good place for the game. And I don't know. I've... The people talk about erratas and stuff like that, but I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that unless the rules don't physically make sense and work, the FFG have said that they want to only change things with upgrade swaps and points. You know, well, like and I think that goes a little bit more further into their, their agreement with LFL too, um, in that changing things like points, the way that they design second edition, they have the ability to change points, change upgrade slots that they can take, add things, subtract things. What they can't change is stuff that is printed on the card, because that yeah. requires to go through LFL to allow them to be able to do that. So they're obviously not going to try to go down that route. Now, the question, of course, becomes, is this as bad as Whisper was in 1.0? Because that's the comparison that I keep seeing. So I've, re I've read the article that I think you're referencing, or that mm -hmm. the people who were referencing it would be referencing, and I think it's a flawed summation in many respects i think um it has a similar feel in that you get to uh you get to hand off the tractor token post so you you theoretically get to make all of your decisions after your opponent yeah, has it's done that everything. advanced knowledge it's everything's yeah. moved on the table and then i can make my decision on what i want so, to do so that, that analogy i would agree with yeah that ties back into the problem of the bid which we've already spoken about and like I definitely am an advocate for the bid should be awarded as points destroyed. Because that, suddenly you can't bid a full vulture for Sunfac anymore. 
Because uh, that literally, when you're looking at Sunfak, you count his bid in number of vultures that you're willing to not take. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I will play if you're playing Initiative Five. I will play you with Sunfak and six vultures. If you've got an Initiative Six, I'll probably want to drop one of those vultures. Yeah. And just literally, I will choose to not take a ship. And that is where I think there is a problem with the game. That, Trimming that, so upgrades it, from ships should be okay in, in my... And this is all Chris's headspace of how I feel like the game should work. I'm not saying that this is the only way it should work. But I think when you get to... Like, there's the stupid cases of, you know, I will fly um, Vader and... Like, we had the conversation of Vader and a Defender, and I was like, okay, I'll take Vader and a Defender and an Academy Pilot, and then I'll fly the Academy Pilot off the table, turn one. And, and just play you- with it. Yeah, and it, it's that level of stupid that I think the bid thing, and that all ties into like the overall problem of Sunfak, because it's that important for him to move last, so that he has this perfect knowledge, that the bid gets ridiculous. And... Once you have that perfect knowledge, the fact that you can't get blocked because you can still track her, so you get to deny him an action. Spoilers for everyone who's not figured this out yet. Uh, DFS one three uh, three one one lets you pass a calculate token to any ship within any friendly ship within range zero to um, one to three. They don't have to have calculate under action bar, so we can still have a calculate from that vulture, even if you block him. So we can yep. still have a, a soft mod. It's really good fun. I enjoyed that because I'm a horrible person. <laughs> um, but I hate myself so much. Don't Sunfak's really, so caveat tangent. Sunfak is really, really good fun to fly. You feel awesome flying it. Just every once in a while, look up at your opponent's face and see if they're still enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> that is um, that is a fair criticism. Yeah, and uh, I've completely forgot what I was saying now. So, um, well, I yeah. do want to. I do want to jump in with one real quick point. It reminds me of Aaron Bonner running Whisper Echo at eighty-eight points. It was the eighty-eight point two Phantom list, yeah. where he had a very similar decision to make. Where he's like, "Well, sure, I could spend twelve points on an Academy pilot that I'm just going to give points to my opponent. I choose not to take that ship because it's super important for me to go first. To have yeah. all that advanced and information. Like, that's the equivalent of a 24 point bid now. Precisely. Um, that's the kind of levels we're looking at with Sunfak. Precisely. And yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's frustrations on all of the normal ways of combating this style of play don't work. So that's like the knee jerk reaction is that, oh, it's an ace, you just block it. Oh, you can't, so you can track to beat himself off you. Right. It's like, well, I'll just point all my arcs in the same direction. Well, you can't because he can track to beam himself out of one and track to beam the other one away from him as well. Yeah, we had a conversation about this off mic before we started recording, and you're like, oh, because I had not considered that. He's like, he can track to beam himself one way. Oh, look, there's a ship that's still in, um, in, that's in firing arc that can shoot me. I'm going to track to beam that one forward. Yeah. So now it can't shoot me. Oh, you, and I went, he wants oh, to wait engage. A <laughs> Yeah, he wants to engage with the rocks, so he just puts you onto a rock so you can't shoot him anyway. And, you know, there's loads of different ways that he mitigates a normal way you would play against an ace. So then you end up having to either tackle it in list building, which people don't like doing because they feel it forces them to not play ships that they like to play, or the more challenging way of combating it on the table. And I think there's things that generally you can try. I think. Um, an enfilade of the formation, so you've got the diagonal line of ships mm-hmm. on, your, on your approach, because it's harder for him to get into range one and dodge multiple arcs, taking gas coins instead of rocks, right <laughs> taking, um, yeah, but controlling where you put the rocks in turn zero, and it's all stuff that is quite abstract to what you think of when playing X-Wing, because people... Don't really start playing X Wing. I, in my experience, you people don't play X Wing until like turn three or four. Yeah, mostly it's positioning. Yeah, it's like, all right, we're in engagement now. I'll start thinking about dodging arcs next turn. Well, were you not thinking about dodging arcs when you put that first rock down? Because <laughs> you should have been. Because you should have been. Yeah, um, and I don't know. It's it's frustrating that. 
they, he does well against what's currently good. And then you, so you get the people who can play. And again, it's just the way the community is. People don't like regening Jedi, and some facts we're getting to regening Jedi. So that part, portion of the discussion completely shuts down that Sunfak is great for a game because it beats this thing that I don't like. Then you've got the group of people who aren't flying either of those things going, yeah, but breaking the game that way to break that thing isn't good either. Yeah, because we went through that once already. Yeah, We've done that um, before. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I, I don't... It becomes this infinite regression of, okay, so this list now beats that list, that now beats that list, that now beats that list. Yeah. It gets us back to where we were at the end of 1.0, and it and it's interesting that we draw this analogy. It started, in my opinion, with the Phantom, yeah, where the Phantom be- broke the meta because for it, it, this is old timers, you know, get off my lawn kind of kind of guys. We were around during those time frames. Whenever um, X Wing first came around, it was Tie Swarm for three waves. They had a whole yeah. bunch of cool ships, like the Phantom had or the um, the Falcon had come out. You had all these, the B Wings came out. You had all these cool ships that had come out. But Tie Swarm was still it because taking seven ships off the board in a timed event was super difficult to do, especially with the efficiency that they were doing it with. So the Phantom I- imagine Ed, Imagine if you could have a Phantom and six Tie Fighters. I know. So you can have Sun Fak and six Vultures. I know. I know. So that's where the analogy in that comes yeah. in, absolutely. But again, so a, a brief history lesson. So that's whenever you had the rise of Fat Han. Fat Han brought rise to the lies of all the turreted ships that can act, that can kill Fat Han, and then we literally start progressing down the meta from to that from from 1.0. Every one of the next builds was the next thing to build the best meta out there, and then it's just it's just a whack a mole. You take one yeah. list off the board, there's a new one. You take one list off the board, there's a new one, and then it doesn't promote an open and, and competitive environment where anyone can bring all kinds of things. When this is the thing that always wins, and you need to go into a tournament going to play against that. That's yeah. where the squealing is coming from. So I can kind of, in a way, to see that to a point. But again, we know FFG is paying attention. If this is that yeah. big of a deal, they just need to find that sweet spot on what's the right points. What does he come in at base right now? Uh, so base, you can't really discuss Sun Fact base because he takes in Snur because the card is basically stapled on. Okay, it's seventy-eight so, points. So it's seventy-eight points. So yeah. again, so you do you want to remove? Wait, ensnares the the the, the the elites or the what am I thinking? The, 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 talent. the talent, yeah. That lets that's what lets him give you the track to beam token. Kind of makes you wonder if they just remove the talent slot because, like you said, you don't want to punish all but, other builds because ensnare you, isn't nearly as good. If you remove good, a talent slot from Sunfak, you effectively remove is ha, has a blank power ability because his bit ability revolves, and that's what I, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, but good I, argument. If you look at his quick build card, because I was the weekend that he came out, we were running a quick build tournament, and on his quick build card he has afterburners. So I played again. I got an A4 sheet of paper, and I put Sunfak facing up the piece of paper at the at the bottom of it, and said to my opponent, "Okay, I'm doing a three straight." If you'd like to put your shit anywhere on this piece of paper, we'll see what happens. Because <laughs> you still get a school. You're still muted. It. Oh, yeah. sorry. I apologize. Yeah. We'll fix yeah. that in post. Uh, so yeah, he, so he's still going to squeal out of it. Is what's going to end up happening. So, well, not as in like a hundred percent of the times. Like we went through his four or five times. I put some fact down. He put his shit down. I didn't get shot. Tractor beamed him and shot him. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, that's literally him being allowed to place his ship anywhere in this zone. It, knowing and knowing time, what, what move I was doing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'm glad that he doesn't have a mod swap because that's with Afterburners and me doing a three straight. But, um, so yeah, if you're playing Quick Build, Sunfax even more fun, you know? Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd. So if you can't don't pull, if you can't how pull you the talent it. slot off of them, what do you? It, it have to be a points adjustment. And this is the thing. This is what really bothers me about a lot of the community and the 
I'm going to say the podcasts in general. I don't mean this is an attack on any podcasts, but in my view, I don't like just raising problems unless I have an idea of a solution because exactly. then it's just whining. And I and that's what I wanted. That's why I put a pin in it to, for this point is I cannot think of a way that I would be happy with some fact which fixes him. So I don't know what you do. So I have the, no I have no answers here. So the So the only other solution in the event and again I recognize I'm gonna peel back into another game that I play, in the event of a card being printed that is clearly over over the top broken, is you ban it. I've well effectively that's what points costing does. <laughs> Like, Does it though? I mean, so like you said, the analogy that you gave, you can run, you can run Sunpack with seven Vulture Droids. So you points cost him out fifty points. You drop two or three more Vultures, and it still does the same thing that it does. It doesn't correct the problem. Well, but it gets to a point where, so if you're playing against so a good way of looking at it, it's okay. Sunpack's on the table, so I'm just going to play Han Solo with Luke Gunner. Mm -hmm. First then thing that I went to tracked, my head. Yeah, his tractor does nothing, and I get to shoot him no matter where he is. And that just kills him. He'll, he will just die. Like, there's no getting around that. Sun fact will die to that list. And you, like, the points cost of hand doesn't ever have to change, but as Sun fact becomes more and more worth it, uh, more and more expensive, the value of taking that hand, regardless of how well it does against the rest of the field, goes up. Because it becomes more and more auto win against this one archetype, which is dominating the rest of the field. Mm -hmm. So you get into the Paul Heaver running R2 and 3PO on his Falcon because it de dominated the Falcon Mirror. And he didn't care about playing against Whisper because the other Falcons would handle the Whispers. And even if he did get paired up against the Whisper, he had a list that he could beat it with. Yeah. Um,. So the way you beat that Falcon currently is if he's chasing some fuck, you still have six vultures. That will tat it yeah. right down. Yeah. Yep. If you can only take four, because some fuck's like a hundred and twenty points at this point, it kinda gets harder and you've got to account for his bid as well. So ramping up the points to a level will work. But I don't think it will work in that you'll see him in a healthy game state. I don't think you can have Sunfac with the way that his ability is worded, the way Pinpoint Tractor Array is worded, and the way Ensnare is worded. I don't think that can exist in a healthy game state. And I, I think we spoke about this off air, so I should caveat all of that statement to make mm -hmm. so that I'm not whining because I'm <laughs> cognizant that there's a lot of negative views on people having this conversation. And I think we tend to come at it from a more reasoned perspective. But Yeah, like we'll we want to try we'll to present see. a solution as opposed to just whine, whine, yeah. whine. Like, yeah. But, I personally, like I said, we, we started the conversation with it. I genuinely don't care. Yeah. It, the, because of how removed I am from the competitive side, it doesn't affect me. It really doesn't. That having been said, I recognize how the competitive drives the game. And we want a healthy competitive state. I can completely agree with that. The question becomes is, how do you solve the problem? What is the best way to solve that problem? And I think the, the issue specifically with Sunfuck, and it comes back to when we've spoken about in the past with um, the handbrake hand situation and the uh, supernatural reflexes, mm -hmm. um, it starts to, when you put your ships down on the table, and fundamentally, on the base level of playing the game, you end up playing a different game from your opponent. I think that's where problems arise, and that's where people foresee this negative play experience, and that uh, that term that's becoming more popularised, especially after FFG um, no, did the uh, the emergency change to triple up swans. Yeah, for the negative uh, play experience that that yeah. was causing. And uh, that's the same kind of thing, because it fundamentally plays the game in a different way. You, Because I get my three joysting ships that have like, terrible initiative. You get to place your entire force, because I just said I'm at initiative seven. Then I set up in your face, and then I shoot you turn one, no matter what you do. Yep. And take a and, minimum uh, of one ship off the board. Yeah, and that 
Well, it's regardless of the result of those actions. It's that is not something that happens when you play X-wing. You 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 normally have agency in if there is going to be a turn one engagement or not. So right. that changes the fundamentals of playing the game. Oh, I, I see feel, what you're getting. Yeah. I see where you're so getting. So I feel like Sun Fact does a similar thing in that he isn't necessarily arc dodging you as an initiative six ace. He's changing your he's nullifying your choices, and you have no agency in that. With so perfect knowledge. Bad. Yeah. So, um, the thing is, he exists. There are there are counters. There are ways to play against it. There are ways to minimize its effect on the game. I don't think the sky is falling, but it doesn't mean that I'm happy about it. And yeah, I don't know. I don't want to dwell on it too much, especially because we're kind of late to party as well. And yeah, like, all and of this will have been said that. before. But, uh, I don't. I know. You know I know. <laughs> it's like. I don't want to rehash old news. I want us to still be a, a fun experience to listen to. And negative rants tend to, in my opinion, take away from that. I think that you your time will be better spent practicing against Sunfact to try and figure out, oh, well, I probably shouldn't let him... If I bring gas clouds and he brings rocks, which he will, I should probably place his rocks every time I get a choice. Exactly. Don't be, let and him let him put up. the gas clouds where he wants. Like, I say we ban the card. That's my solution. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> say, like, nope. Oops, we made a bit oopsie on this one. And then they could re- reprint the. Um, they already have card packs coming out. They could reprint the card with a new pilot with a new pilot ability and say that yeah. that is now the legal one. That's how you solve it. You ban that version of the card and then reprint it in one of the pilot packs. Yeah. I don't know. The problem is if you look at it in isolation, the Nantex is a really, really well designed c- card and ship. But the way that it feels when you fly it is really, it feels like it's doing what you think it would do when you read what the card text says. So, like, it's swinging its gun with its tractor array and, you know, the movements it gets and the way it flies, it's really well done. It's just bullshit in the game. Yeah, so. it's just one pilot. <laughs> one pilot is bullshit in the game. Let's make sure we're, it, once we clear that one up. Yeah. I, All right, and so. it's fine. I'm I'm more than happy. So I I will end this segment on ways that I think you can start to try and play against it without just take trying to take hard counters, and that is you. I'm not gonna. You, this is gonna be a uh, the classic internet shit take of shoot him at range three. It's easy, but it's. You you have to you can't stay at range three even with all of your ships. So you don't group your ships as tightly in a formation. So don't fly your four X wings in a block like you're used to in every game. Maybe adapt your deployment to have a line of them and come out at different angles. So it, he can't get all of them at range one because when it is in tighter, he'll dodge more arcs. Think about your rocks. Think about your rock placements because again, people will generally place. The first two things they play are generally their own rocks before they even think about, oh, what the hell have my opponent brought? Because you bring your rocks because they're a known quantity, so you're used to putting them in certain places. Especially if they're part of your plan. Yeah, but I think like we did it in one of our games. It's like, I'm taking that. Your, I grabbed your rock immediately. My big fat rock. It, yeah, <laughs> like, this is going over here. There's no. Yeah, that was a hand game, wasn't it? Where, it was. It's it yeah. a perfect example of, a, of I'm going to take your strategy that you came in with and I'm going to reverse it and play it against you. Yeah, it's like Han wants big rocks where the engagement's going to be. So that means I don't want big rocks where the engagement is going to be. Simple. <laughs> so I look at what. And people tend to not do it. I don't know. So. Uh, bring gas clouds, and then place the rocks in places the engagement isn't going to be. Exactly. Uh, it, and it sounds easy and reductive, and it is, but there's truth within that, that those are the things you've got to start considering. So there you go. Sunfax fine. It's good fun. Everyone should fly him and <laughs> fly against him, and the game will be fine. The game will and be fine. The even game will be fine. Uh, if we if we remove Sunfac, there is other broken stuff that we'll complain about after that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
All right, so let's move on to me being right about something. <laughs> in the news, uh, we've got to cover a couple of things. I don't know if you covered it in your solo one. I don't remember hearing this I didn't do any news and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, FFG announced on... I've got to move my camera thing. Uh, it looks like September 3rd. So, wow, it's been, it has been a month since I've been on with you. Uh, on September 3rd, they're going to be releasing Damage Decks Per Faction, which was the last dangling thread of the starter kit. So I said way back in the day, whenever um, Scum and Villainy was announced, that the starter kit was kind of silly for a Scum and Villainy player because they've got to buy ships that they don't need, that they don't intend to play, simply because they needed a damage deck and some of the core components for it. We got a core components pack a while back, and now, especially this is way more important now, with seven factions in the game, now you don't need to buy a starter kit. You can buy your core components back, you can buy your damage deck, and then buy the ships you want to go. Thank you, FFG. I'm so happy I was right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. I I want them to be out sooner rather than later for exactly those reasons. Because I was chatting to a guy um, literally last night. I don't know. It would have Friday, so not literally yesterday. I don't know. I could have lied. It's a podcast. Who's going to check? Yeah, but, who's going to um, check? Who knows? <laughs> but I, was ch- I was chatting to this guy the other day. And he was talking about getting back into it. He used to play in 1.0. And it's like, well, you can now play a single faction. You don't have to play all of them. So, oh, I really like the Fire Spray. I might go with Scum and Villainy then. It's like, oh, well, you still have to buy a core set, though. And I've already got TIE Fighter. And, it and was- these are cheap, too. Five dollars. <clears throat> Good job, yeah. guys. <laughs> and it was fine. You know, it, it was he still he bought a corset and then going to list all his ships and inventory, everything he's got for he makes his decisions. But it's hard being like working in the store and trying to help people that, oh, I really want to fly Jedi. So they seem cool and awesome, the clones and everything. So, okay, well, let me take some money off you for this stuff you're never going to use. And then uh-huh. we can start talking. Yeah. It's always yeah. that feel. You were you talking about that negative play experience. That's that feel bad experience of, oh, I've got to buy a corset that has stuff in it that I'm going to never touch because all I'm really buying are the damage deck and the core components, the dice and things like that. That's it. That's all I'm really buying. And I I guarantee that it will be pretty much as expensive to buy the uh, the deluxe range rulers, Mm -hmm. a dice or two dice packs and the damage deck will be practically as much as buying a, and, and you need the asteroid so you need to get the obstruction pack mm-hmm. so those five things will probably add up to the cost of a corset but, but it won't matter because in your head you're not buying something you don't need exactly fundamentally i'm okay with that because you're not getting sticking them with stuff that they don't genuinely need do yeah. we know if these are the full-size ones like so uh, again if they you have a big our- cards i believe they are the big full-size yeah, so ones the same size as the t65 damage deck <sighs> which not everybody got because I, I saw there's one to give away somewhere. I yeah, because I, I saw the resistance one and I saw the rebel one and I was like, oh, is that the same one? Did I seriously like get the pre order? Oh no, it's not. Woo-hoo, all right, I'm good. <laughs> Tie interceptor, I think, on the imperial. I know, I know. I'm definitely gonna pick that one up. So yeah. I just like being right for once. And this is something <laughs> I have been screaming about since Scum and Villainy came out. Um, it did take them having seven factions to come around <laughs> to the idea of doing four components. So. You're you're welcome, FFG. <laughs> just put my yeah. name somewhere on it. I'll just yeah. get the commission. It's fine. Yeah. Every sale, it's okay. The royalties, it one percent, one percent royalties. How hard could that be? <laughs> All right. So other things that I'm I'm super excited about. We got not one but two, um, epic uh, articles. The first I'm looking at is the uh, in the captain's chair, which uh, goes over huge ship movement. Very similar to Let how me see they. This is the one that I need to complain at people at Uh i think it i think it's this one okay so what it did though is it confirmed all of our suspicions when we started seeing things come out for like the uh the raider for example they did confirm that the engagement value is zero so there is a the the dual initiative why it's got an eight and a zero on the raider it did confirm that they they do get to perform two actions which is sort of similar to what they used to do in first edition where the front the the aft and um the fore and aft used to have their own separate uh, action bars it did confirm that shields and energy are reoccurring all of that stuff was fantastic we all kind of gleaned at that um we did get a look at the movement template that came along with it which stinks because i have to get a new movement new movement template i think um because i don't think that the old one translates now because the way the old one used to have it used to have a little hook at the end so whenever like moving a huge ship forward is super easy 
It's yeah. when they start doing those turns in the banks that become a little bit more difficult. So the old one used to have a hook at the end and used to put it on the front hook and you kind of like slid it in. Um, this one's just an angle. I think it's very similar, but I'm not positive. I'm going to have to see it on the table to see how well it uh, translates over. Because mm. I don't want to get rid of my, like, I have already one of my acrylic ones, but it has Nova <laughs> Squadron Radio on it. Obviously, the old uh, the old show, at some point in time. Fine. At some get point get time, someone to laser cut the angle on it. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. But they did confirm the movement on that one. They also confirmed, uh, thank God, that they're only going to have one damage deck for all huge ship, as opposed to toting around <laughs> individual damage decks, both fore and aft, for every ship, huge ship in the game. Now it's just one, and individual damage ones uh, can pull off hard points and weapons and things like that, which is really kind of cool. Yeah. That's good. Um, do you want to go into the Delivering Hope? The Tantif one? That was the Kay. last article I was going to cover, which is the, obviously we have the article of the, the Tantif Five is that the correct? Name? So I've heard the Tantive. Tantive Four, isn't it? Yeah, it's the Tantive Four. It's always been the Tantive Four, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Anyone else? Someone else gave me a different pronunciation on the Tantive, and I'm like, I don't think that's right. <laughs> yeah. But we got an opportunity to say what's actually coming in the box on this one. We get to see the dial. Um, pretty stock standard. I like the fact that it can stall for a red remove red maneuver. Um, again, we noted that all the energy has been removed off all these, so they are going to move like regular ships. Um, we did get um, the full statistics on the Alderanian Guard. Got four forward, four aft, zero evade, 18 hull, seven shields, seven rechargeable energy with a focus target lock, reinforce, coordinate, and jam. That's a lot of actions. So I got to do two of them. It'd be fine. Yeah, and then you get the Rebel Judicary, because of course they're going to split factions on which ones they're going to do. Same statistics, although are the, yeah, no, the, the, the baked-in abilities, uh, the broadside batteries, you can acquire locks and perform primary attacks at range 1 to 4 um, on both of those. So those basically stayed the same. So the, the thing I wanted to talk about from this article was Ramus Antilles. I'm because people have been whining and complaining and I I really just don't get it. Right. It's like they don't actually want to be able to play the game. Right. I, I just want something to complain about on the internet so that I feel cool rather than like just just play. I'm pretty sure it's okay. So, so let's you, get in. You I've may have missed it, Ed. But I've got um, him in front of me. Where there's a new rules reference as well. So What's there's that? a big there was a new a new rules reference guide came out which changed a couple of things, like uh, adding stuff to the ability queue and stuff like that. But that's by the by. We'll just look at this card and we'll break it down. But Ramus Antilles is Rebel, and this is the real kicker, is Rebel, huge ship only. Yeah. And so you can only play this card if you play an epic. Right. Okay. I was curious if they were going to do, because one of the stigmas that they had with Epic before is you had things like, oh, C-3PO, for example, in three point in 1.0, the only way you can get him was with a $100 ship. Emperor Palpatine, same thing. People would run out and buy the Raider just to get Palpatine be and never fly the ship. So I was uh, curious if they were going to do standard X-Wing crew with these and i haven't gotten that they far sell yet. card packs now anyway so yeah fair argument just do what you want man it's off right uh, so ramus antilles after you are destroyed each friendly ship at range zero to one gains one focus token after you are destroyed you are not removed until the end of the end phase so it gets one volley off before it dies so people are saying well, I need to get an accurate representation. People are saying, um, that means that, that when, exact I'm sound too. <laughs> when I'm destroyed, I have to, um, uh, abilities that are triggered when you're destroyed happen immediately before you're removed, which means that I only get the tokens at the end of the end phase, not in the turn that it gets destroyed. Oh, I see. And then it gets into like the end phase debacle that there's no actual timings for when things happen in the end phase. 
you just have to remove all circular tokens. They all come off. No, not so. Yeah, all green, circular all tokens. tokens. It's green and orange all come off. Oh, right, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, I think wow. it specifies circular tokens in 2.0, and it's okay. I, I got you. I'm, okay, I was going to say, because I was, I was under the impression that it was... Okay, gotcha. Um, but, but point... Uh, this is... So, at its very base, there are two abilities triggering on this card. Pick what order you want. Because so you get to add them to the ability queue. So, yeah, I'll, I'll do this and then this. Or... Even if you don't think that's right, and it's all one ability, okay. So I'll before I remove this ship, I'll do the thing that it says on the card in the order that it's said on the card. So I hand out the tokens. Oh, and then I go to immediately remove it, and oh, I, I don't remove it yet. But I've already done the other one, so I don't have to take those tokens back. It's okay. <laughs> and then you get the arguments of well. <clears throat> If I get the tokens in the end phase, it's the end of the end phase, so surely they'll carry over to the next turn. But then removing tokens is a persistent effect through the end phase, through different interpretations. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, dude, you're playing epic. I don't care. Do what you want. Like, <laughs> this is like a rules is written versus a rules <laughs> is intended. I think it's clear that the rules is intended is that at initiative <laughs> seven, if the Corvette is destroyed. All other ships around it get a focus token. It, the ship sticks around until the end of the end phase of the that turn and then is removed, meaning it still yeah. gets to shoot before it dies. Yeah, but, but that's that's you, you read the card. You wanted to push your giant Tantif 4 around the table and pew pew things, so you read it like a normal person. But what you have to think about, Ed, is if you'd have, rather than having fun doing that, if you generated your fun by pointing out that FFG is terrible in every way, shape, and form, and that you're so much cleverer than the people who write the rules and wanted to just post on internet forums, then uh, you might have a different view. So this this could be this word this whole wording can be fi fixed with one word immediately. Immediately after you're oh, remember, immediately doesn't actually have any. I know that <laughs> they would need to define that. I agree, but immediately after you're destroyed, each rather ship range one gets in there, and then after you were destroyed, you were not removed into the <laughs> phase. That would solve it. They would have to define immediately so that it had a an intrinsic in game value, which would actually solve a couple of other problems. It's not just yeah. Here. Well, I I, w I want to point out that obviously this is all tongue in cheek, but yeah. It's ambiguous, but like, dude, you're playing epic. You, <laughs> it's supposed to be the fun version matter? of the game. Like, just have why? Like, <laughs> what? So me and you are playing. I've got Ramus and Tilly's, and you're like, I don't think it works like that, Chris. And I'm like, cool, we'll play it. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I don't care. It's epic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's Can to be a I? Fun uh, game. Can I pew pew? You know, I'm gonna launch my proton torpedoes at you. Yeah, ooh, and you know. <laughs> I just, I can't, this, so, this is coming from me, having just spent, like, my week vacation typing up a rules document to post on the rules forum to try and cover stupid rules questions and, like, things that keep coming up and then ambiguous areas of the rules and give all the different interpretations. So I put a lot of effort into trying to make the game easier for people to play. And even I'm like, just it's epic, man. Just do what you want. I, I go back care. to your rule of thumb. If a ruling creates a garbage fire or a dumpster fire, don't do that. Do the yeah. other one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like genuinely, like if this becomes that complicated, which which phase of the end phase does this act? No. <laughs> like it, like you said, it's epic. It, it should be. It, to me, it reads relatively clearly. I can see where the interpretation's coming. We start getting into these weird, dark shadows of the rules where things aren't entirely a little fuzzy, but come on. I, I definitely think that it's something that the community needs to push back on, is this perception of how cool it is and how you are the clever one if you are finding, like, digging for these mistakes. And, like, the... The corner case within a corner case. So, <clears throat> one example. <clears throat> sorry, one example that I've been going through recently was if a if you place the incorrect dial next to a ship, what happens? So, if I'm flying a, t a tie striker 
and a tie advanced. And I put the tie advanced dial down next to my tie striker. And, my, and the striker dial is off to the side because the tie advance is dead. So I'm now using the wrong dial for that shit. What happens? And it's like, well, it's not in the rules because the rules cover what you're supposed to do and you're not supposed to do that. So there aren't rules for that because it's not supposed to happen. And if you play by the rules, it won't happen. Mm-hmm. All right, so put your judge yeah. hat on. What does happen yeah. in this? So I, I, I said, well, you flip the, you do what's on the dial. If it's legal, it's fine, but you do it at the color that should be on the dial. So like, if you've got a red hard one, but it's blue on the dial, you do the red one, not the blue one that's on the incorrect dial, obviously. Oh god, <clears throat> I see where this is going. <laughs> yeah, but, but then it's like. What happens um, if that maneuver if, isn't on the dial? Yeah, or it's I'm like, well, stressed okay, and it, it's a red maneuver and now no. it's not? When, yeah. So if you reveal a dial and then the maneuver is an illegal maneuver, what do you do? So, okay, well, the old rule of like, to do a two white straight seems fine. Mm-hmm. Then it's like, oh, what if we've got repositioning? Like, well, okay, you can only do a focus or a calculate action as your action. And then someone's like, well, what about if they've got a, adaptive ailerons because it's a tie striker and before we reveal the wrong incorrect dial they get to do the aileron move and then they reveal the incorrect dial re- realize it wasn't a legal move and have to do a one white straight but they've changed the way the ship so surely we should have to aileron forwards as well or the ailerons don't trigger and i'm like well look man <laughs> You're now so deep in the weeds of this thing <laughs> that shouldn't happen because it's against the rules. Like, as, uh, if I see you put a tie advanced dial next to your tie striker, uh, you p- watch, that's the wrong dial, mate. Oh, cheers. Yeah, I've, and I myself have been guilty of it myself. Like, I'll sit there and start yeah. dialing in a dial and go, wait a minute, that's not blue on this ship. Yeah, and go, you, oh, people I've do it all of the time. It, it's something that will happen, but you yeah. can't get like that tied down in... Oh, that, that that's possibly abuse. Like, someone could abuse that. And it's like, yeah, but ultimately, the way, if someone wants to cheat by doing that, there are so many better ways for them to cheat. Yes. And I, 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 just play the game. I don't know. <laughs> or, <clears throat> what, was, what was the other one? Uh, yeah, just so many um, weird and wonderful interactions that, you end up going down that rabbit hole and it just destroys any chance you're going to have of enjoying the game if you pursue that line of thinking when you're reading these cards. Yeah. So No, I and just, I think that happens with, with any complex game system, there are some weird interactions that were not thought of when the rules were written. It's and you will find that you will like you said, you will find those corner cases within corner cases like what happens if this and this and this and this happens? The only way to obviously solve that is through an FAQ, um, FFG, to make FFG aware of it. But you're right, like, it shouldn't, especially in a game of Epic, shouldn't st- bring a game to a grinding halt while there's a 45 minute debate on how, whether or not the focus tokens do or do not happen and when they, like, ugh. Yeah, like, I just, like, I can't, I can't even, you know, it's like, you're you're at the point in the game and the community are at that point now where playing the game's irrelevant. It, it's now about being right in the rules forums and like the way 40k was in like 2006 <laughs> type thing. Oh boy, were those the days. Yeah, right. Once you start get telling people on the forums that they're an idiot for taking Howling Banshees in the Howling Banshee themed army instead of striking scorpions because striking scorpions kill like 0.7 more of a space marine a turn, <laughs> like, dude, it's a Howling Banshee list. Yeah, I'm it- not gonna take scorpions and count. Count them as banshees all the other way around or whatever. It's leave me alone. Like I'm going, it's fine. It's you know, a game. I'm trying to have maybe fun. Maybe I'll enjoy myself <laughs> and not kill that one extra space marine. It's okay. My <laughs> my son always goes back to the the to- the one time that he had a whole bunch of grunts that were able to kill a land raider just because he had oodles of them. Statistically, it shouldn't happen ever, but it did, and yeah. it can happen. Yeah, but it's what you. You've got to decide, right, fundamentally, why am I playing this game? And 
depending on what the answer is, you know, you, those are only questions you can answer yourself. And I, I don't know. I, I've, I've seen both sides because I don't play as much competitively anymore, but I still run all of our competitive events. So I still address all of these questions. Yeah, so and you need to at least it. stay in tune with what's going on at least. Yeah. And I, I, I try and when people ask me for advice, I'll give them like options and advice and go through and like talk about the list and why I think something is a suboptimal choice and why I think something would work better in those instances. But I don't, I, it's me, so I'll do it in a mocking tone, but I try and always finish with, or oh, do what you're enjoying doing at the moment. It's fine. It's okay. You're <laughs> all, uh, even if what you're doing is suboptimal, that's allowed too. You're allowed to just play something you enjoy. It's okay. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. It's okay to run a list that is just fun because you saw it in the movies and you want to replicate the trench run um, TIE Fighter Squad with Vader and the Black Squadron. Totally fine. Yeah. Does yeah. it have to be the most optimal list? No. And I think that's... I think every game that in any way, shape, or form has a tournament format established in and around it, you'll always have those players like, well, that's not the optimal build. You're clearly not playing the game right. He's like, but I'm enjoying it. I'm having yeah. fun with it. Maybe I'm, and I don't want to say that. I don't, I, I want to caution how I want to say it. Everyone has the right to enjoy the game the way they want to. If yeah. playing the game hard nosed, competitive is how you enjoy the game, that's great. If, Playing fun themey list because I f I want to make pew pew noises is the way that I enjoy the game. I'm also running the and playing the game the right way. And that's it. It comes back to what I said when we're talking about Sun Fak. It's like if I go to a casual night, I'll I'll throw down one proper game against Sun Fak and give it my all and I try hard it and give you a competitive practice game. But if I'm there for a casual night, I don't want that all all the way through. I want to fly something a little bit different, try one of my more fun squads, and then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play against someone who's running Sunfact with one of those squads because it's a disservice to their practice and my enjoyment. So uh, they'll they'll get to feel awesome because Sunfact flies around and just kills everything, but they don't learn anything from the game, and I don't get to enjoy myself. So. Yeah, it's that whole social but, contract thing. We all have that as gamers. Yeah, we, we hammer on that all the time. and I, I feel like it's something we should continually keep doing. The social contract is massively important. And even when you go to a tournament, it, you, you have to acknowledge that you're at a competitive event, but you're allowed to want to enjoy playing on the bottom tables. That's okay. Just playing against different people can be a goal in of itself when you go to an event. Mid-table obscurity. Woo! <laughs> it, like, you don't have to go to an event with a view to winning it. I think that's a disservice to like 99 people out of 100 who go to an event because only one of them is going to win it. That was probably one of the most um, eye-opening events I think I ever had where I went to a regional tournament, big, huge, competitive regional tournament, the guy I was playing was from Atlanta, and we were here in Pittsburgh. And his, and he was not bringing an optimal list in any way, shape, or form. That was when I was heavy into my tournament play. And I asked him a couple of questions after the game, like, well, why did you take this, and why did you take this? And all of his answers were the same. Well, you know, this is more themey. This is the character that worked with this character in the books. Or this is the ship that they were flying when they went here in this particular mission. And it was an epiphany for me. And He's like, I don't have a lot of people to play with in my area. So for yeah. me, I drove here and paid the money to play six games of X-Wing because I don't have the opportunity to play six games of X-Wing against real people in person. This is the reason why I paid my money. I didn't come here to win. I came here to play games. And that is a huge paradigm shift whenever you see like, that guy, that guy's doing it right for that guy. Yeah. Didn't go into the event with the intention of winning it in any way, shape, or form. Built his list very theme-like in the way that was fun for him and he and Jordan. That is the right way to do it for him. I don't know if we talked spoke about this at all either, but um, it was a bit of fault. In fact, you know, because we we I don't think we recorded a show since. But uh, when Nova uh, the Nova Open happened, uh, there was some flack directed at FFG because of the the, the prizing for the event. No, uh, I was, didn't hear any of this. There was no this. participation prizing as part of the event. Uh, it was top sixty four, I think, was where the prizing started, and. I, that is a little unusual for FFG. I will give them that. It's unusual, 
And I, just, I didn't, I didn't understand the mentality though that I didn't get. Like, if they gave out a card, it would be massively common because they're literally giving it to everybody, so it would have no monetary value. So if like if getting Actually, some some I random still- piece of cardboard is what's important for you know if that's more important to your financial investment of going to the event than actually playing the games because you remember you're covering the cost of the hall and the staff mm-hmm. working the event and if uh, you know all of that stuff is comes out of the money you give them uh, the the event doesn't just magically happen for free all of the time uh, the so I don't know I I don't get where that and it's really alien to me that um, just yeah, right. This entitled mentality of it. Mm-hmm. But, and, and so you were going to say something. Sorry. Well, I was going to. Well, what I was going. The only thing I was going to say is I want to correct myself because I, I stand corrected because I know that I have talked to. I've been to regionals. I've talked to people who've gone to the nationals and worlds where they didn't give out cards. It was only to like the top sixty four, the top one twenty eight, yeah. depending on where they go. So that's actually. I want to retract that statement. I think that that is actually a par for the course for. For um for FFG events now, would you have liked that to have happened for a nationals event like that at at Nova? Sure, but that's not really been the norm. Yeah, uh, generally FFG is really good with the pricing, uh, oh, so it, it came as a bit of a surprise to people, which is I think what stirred it up more than anything was the shock value of it. But like. Uh, at a hyperspace, or when it used to be regionals or star championships, I think we used to only get like thirty-two copies of a card. Exactly. So if you were the thirty-third, thirty-fourth player, because if they, yeah. you had a good TO, he'd be like, "Yeah, I've already got a copy of this, and I'm going to run another one later." Here, you can have my copy for the thirty-third player. But yeah, if you were like thirty-six, yeah, you just didn't get one. Yeah, and I generally they provide more than your event is going to have seats for. But that's not always the case. They've always been a finite number of cards. I think there's been some specific events where if you if like FFG were told the the stores effectively that if you think you're going to have more than this number of people, you can reach out to us and get extra cards. But I like worlds, for example. Like when we went to worlds, like they gave you, and I still have it. It's probably actually behind me on the wall behind me. Um, they gave out that blue card case, and in that blue card case were all these special alt art cards for all of the games that are being played that weekend, which included some of the yeah, Azafoth uh, for the Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, I think exactly. I've still got mine somewhere. <laughs> the the Song of Ice yeah. and Fire ones were in there too, but that's also where you got like the Grand Moff Tarkin was in there, and then that's where the Vader card came in for that particular event. That one. Now that yeah. was a participation prize. Everyone who went to Worlds got that, but you knew that going in. Yeah. Some of these other ones, though, like I think they say specifically in the articles, there's only X number of these going in. So I don't know if they did that for the Nova again. I didn't pay that close attention. Yeah, no, I didn't either. It just, like I said, it just surprises me that that's something that people got worked up on. I, I didn't get my two cent piece of cardboard. So those five games I got to play meant nothing to me and I had no enjoyment. I can no longer enjoy <laughs> FFG games. Ever. How dare they? So I, I think you played for cards. a wrong reason, buddy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever thought about playing Star Wars games because they're Star Wars games and they're fun? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe. But again, <laughs> as Ed said, you know, you're allowed to play a game for whatever reasons you like. <laughs> if, um, if the mighty pursuit of prizes you can then sell to people is your one and only motivator, like crack on. Just fly better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. I think that's going to cover all the news. We actually went around down quite a few rabbit holes, but that's what happens whenever I don't talk to you for a month. That happens. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you posted questions or not, or if you want to go anything through that, if you left questions over from the last time. Um, we actually didn't I talk about this on camera. No, camera, I don't so. think I have. <laughs> the pro- in fact, we can talk about the, que- the poll I put up, I suppose. That's what we can end on. Sure. Uh, let me uh, see what comments we had there. So I posted a question at the start of the week, which was, um, I'm going to get the exact wording, uh, negative outlooks on podcasts making the X-Wing community more negative, or is the negativity in the community fueling nev- negativity on X-Wing podcasts post-Wave 5? Uh, then uh, for the answers, I had 
podcasts are to blame or we were already negative. Hmm. Uh, we were already negative, had 59% of a vote to a that 41%. Right. <laughs> so, and, um, <laughs> Coming from know. the podcast side, I'd like to respond. Like, I'd like to give my official response on that one. Um, I've been obviously on both sides of it. We've been part of a, a, a hyper competitive, tournament centered podcast in the past. Obviously, we're way more casual and way more fun. I don't know. Maybe fun's not the right word. Way more laid back uh, than we were in in the past. That having been said, it's sort of it's part of your job when doing a podcast on a game to cover the latest news. And if something negative, there is a negative feel going on, they kind of have to cover it. Um, But I hope that we try to do it like in the way that we tried to do it, as opposed to just whining about it, trying to propose solutions, trying to find a way to get around what the individual problem is. I think it's, uh, I don't know that I necessarily would say that podcasts are necessarily driving it, but they're definitely bringing more attention to it. So like an event like this with, Sunpack, which we spent quite a bit of time talking about today, I don't know that I would have heard about it if it hadn't yeah. been for the press that it was getting in other shows. And I think one of the things I have, so I'm gonna, I will, I'll talk about Sunfac specifically, but I don't mean this in definite reference to Sunfac. It's more of a overarching, it's easier to talk about it on a specific case. So. There'll be another Sunpack uh, in six months and yeah, we'll have something think, else to complain about. Yeah, the problem with the negativity around Sunfac, and this again, this is just my opinion, is that if you so you'd never heard of Sunfac and didn't know anything going into a game and we played and I put Sunfac down post this discussion, you're gonna have a different reaction to me placing Sunfac on the table to what you would have if you just didn't know. It's like, oh, is that a new Nantex? Cool. Is that Sunfac? Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. And All right. Fair you're, argument. you're now framed to go into this experience and not have fun. See, so. Uh, I don't know. For me, I'm always that competitive. There is a shark of me that's that competitive. Like, okay, I want to try to beat this with what I've got in front of me. Like, I, I represent it as a challenge, but I guess I'm a little different. Is there a no fun factor to it? Sure. Absolutely. I get but, that. You know, as in. You're not, it's very hard to go into something with an open mind when, I'm going to use words that aren't necessarily applicable to all instances of this, but when you've been listening to people you like and respect talk about um, about different like scenarios and ship power levels and things like that, you then, that will colour your opinion. Well, you, that's how being human works. Uh, we're social animals, we take um, at direction from group mentality and group think and all of that stuff um, and it's a real th- like group think is a real thing You the echo chamber of the different the exact word that I was going to use yeah, uh, the, the different um, for fa- I, I, Facebook groups because I'm like old fashioned and don't really know any other social media but uh, uh, being on those Facebook groups and in those conversations having the same things repeated it becomes an established fact and you you might enjoy try like you could have enjoyed five games against Sunfact trying to figure out how you were going to beat it then come to a conclusion that it's broken overpowered and shouldn't be in the game but i've taken five games of enjoyment away from you by hammering into you that it's not fun and shouldn't be in the game yeah you've poisoned so the well you, with the uh, the opinion before i've ever played against it yeah exactly i totally agree so and i don't know i don't know if that's right or wrong but that's like my take on it that's i try to offer solutions to a problem when i can think of them and i always try to be open-minded to both even when we're like doing rules debates and stuff like that i try i'll have my i'll form an opinion but then i try and look at it from the other side of it and the other side of this is like Sunfact's really good fun to fly. Yeah, so if you're one, a Sunfact, one of you is absolutely. Fun. <laughs> yeah. The, the, um, the positive spin that you can take from this, though, is that when something like this happens, though, this is how it gets addressed. Is through the fandom rising up and saying, hey, wait a minute, 
this one piece doesn't fit in with the rest. Something clearly isn't working. There's clearly an imbalance here. I mean, I recognize that they're using way more colorful language when it comes down to it. But ultimately, again, these are how changes are made. So there is that aspect to it. There's, there's, there needs to be a way to bring it into focus and be able to bring it to the attention of those in charge of the game in that FFG saying, hey, we're not having a lot of fun flying against this. Yeah, and it kind of comes down to, like, even when you raise something to FFG, so I, I don't know if I'd be talking out of school here, but in fact, I can do this better. So um, I'm going to use a tangential example that may relate to things I know about X-Wing that I can't talk about. But uh, if you look at the Song of Ice and Fire miniatures game, uh, one of the designers for that does a podcast where he'll talk about the game, and it's just him talking for like 15 to 30 minutes. Well, it must be like that podcast that short. Yeah. <laughs> right. He'll do a, a deep dive on a unit or an upgrade or something. And he'll have a, like, a couple of minutes where he'll just talk about stuff that's been going on. And he's like a big, just read the card. Like, why you, don't ask, that's, that's a stupid question. Just do what it says on the card. That's always nice. <laughs> and like, you then know that if, if a designer gives that response, it's not going to make the FAQ. Yeah, because it's clearly so, obvious that that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. But then he got, I, I can't remember what the exact example was, but yeah, he got like beaten down and then it goes in the FAQ and it's like a yes or a no answer. And like, it, you get that, like, when something is obvious and uh, in the defense of the people asking the question, everything you know as fact is obvious when you are asked it. Uh, it it's the 29th today. We both know that. That's obvious. A listener listening to this wouldn't know that. Yes, exactly. So that is, it's so not a stupid it's question to them. Yeah. yeah. So, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. It, it's just annoying that we don't we tend to not offer people the respect of their opinion might be but whilst they may be wrong the question might still be worth asking and i think um chris owen kind of not didn't have a go at me it was we were having a conversation but as i said so i i often use uh, what what does the card say and when I'm asking, I don't, I try not to say, do what the card says. I ask, what does the card say? And I'm trying to engage them into thinking about it rather than just dismissively saying, it's obviously what's on the card. So it's a subtle difference, but, you know, I'll hold my hands up, but my delivery could lead it to be uh, <laughs> taken as such. But, um, I. Right. It was a really. It was an interesting. It was just a throwaway line that he put on a um, a Facebook post. But it's like, if I say just do what the card says enough, can I dismiss the question as if it wasn't worth asking? Oh, I guess I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, and it's like, mm-hmm. right? If he's asking the question, it's obviously a reason. So you've got to analyze. Is it a fundamental misunderstanding of a base rule that is not comprehended through not reading the rules reference fully? So whilst the um, a good one here is the like the the disarm token for vultures and energy shell charges. It's not that the like the card might appear to be clear, but enough people asked it that evidently there is some misunderstanding and confusion and I believe that it stems from the lack of the real world symbol because it never explains properly in the rule book that the words real like the word for any action that has a symbol a hieroglyphic are interchangeable the yes. words and the symbol mean the same thing they are interchangeable and can be used interchangeably so mm-hmm. uh, if that's not covered it could lead you to believe that one is a reload action and one is the process of reloading or whatever. So 
Yeah, I if can you see don't understand, you know, if you don't understand that going, it's like, well, it's not got a reload action symbol on it, so it's not a reload. Well, it tells you to reload the cut. You know what I mean? You, there's a giant rabbit hole. I'm not going into it again, but it's not that the question isn't worth asking. It's that you've got to take the time to appreciate why it's being asked and then work backwards sometimes. So. Yeah, find out where the misunderstanding is first and then work your way up. Yeah. Cool. All yeah. right, I think that's going to cover it. Um, You have I see, some uh, housekeeping you'd like to do? Um, Yeah, we have a few new Patreons, so thank you everyone who signed up. Um, it's been going really well. I'm extremely uh, encouraged by uh, we're at episode 35. So I still managed to get content out, and whilst I've not had anyone say, oh, that was an awesome show, no one actually complained. So whether that's just because no one at all listens to us, <laughs> that's okay. But there was no like, oh God, listening to Chris for an hour just made me want to kill myself. <laughs> so um, so that feedback did not come back. That's good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks to everyone who suffered through episode 34. I do. Again, I can only apologize. apologize. Yeah. Oh, it, I I had opportunities to get other people on, but I kind of delayed it to the last minute in the hope that we could do something. Yeah, no, and again, I take the blame for that. I'd wind up. So I could have had Bruno back on to do stuff, but I, he could only record on a Monday evening, and then I wouldn't have had time to edit it and get it out on time, and or the Wednesday, and it's already late. So I was like, well, I'll record it Monday during the day get it edited and posted and then I'll see if I can work something else out. So yeah. Like so much so like Chris was even saying, well, is Thursday still a good, uh, uh, this is peak behind the curtain. We normally record on Thursday nights. Chris is like, is Thursday is even still a good day to record. The short answer to the question is yes. Once this thing at work is done, which will be done this week, thank God, everything goes back to normal and Thursdays is fine for me. It's just the last six weeks have been brutal with work. So hopefully we won't have that problem anymore. Yeah. But we'll be good. We'll get there. Um, yeah, I suppose do all of the uh, stuff that Chad normally covers. Uh-huh. Um, so you can uh, find us on YouTube at Dice Hate on YouTube. You Make sure you check out our Facebook page, which is Lack of Focus Podcast on Facebook. You can follow me on Instagram, Dice Hate Chris. I post all of my um, like yeah, contrast paint, painting on there. And uh, you can email us at dice hate. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. You can email us at lack of focus podcast at gmail.com. There you go. And it's because I've got the dice hate overlay on because <laughs> there's only two of us. I understand. Um, yeah. I get confused and also I'm stupid, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, I have posted in the rules the Facebook. Okay, let's get this correct. The X-Wing Miniatures Game Rules Question Group on Facebook. I did post a 17-page um, document that covers some... Manifesto. <laughs> yeah, rule. Manifesto's not a bad one. But it has to forward. <laughs> um, so some of the people who were helping me put it together uh, made me change my forward because the forward was initially titled um, Forward or why you should just throw this document away <laughs> and not use it. Like, you probably shouldn't put that, Chris. Probably just put, like, oh, how this document can be used. And I, you know, trying to ch change the tone of it a little bit, but um, it doesn't replace a community judge document that, like, Chris Brown and all the Judge Illuminati are doing. They still have their stuff. I just wanted to tackle stuff that, one, was more player-centric, comes from questions I see in the rules question group when I'm moderating it. And then two had stuff that wasn't addressed yet, because obviously they have a process they have to go through, whereas in I can do what I want because it's just me effectively. I'll ask for input from other people, but ultimately I'm a person who types it all out. And I try to present both sides of the multiple sides. Like the end phase one is probably over a page of A4 of text of different interpretations of how the end phase could work and then which one I recommend and why I recommend it that way. But, you know, it There's a lot of hard work in there. Yeah, hopefully FFG 
will address them at some point and I'm just trying to put it out there more often. Uh, ultimately, it is for me so that I have how I will rule at my events and I have it all written down so I don't have to kind of like reference four different things. But if anyone else wants to use it, it's there. It'll be updated probably every week every other week it might just be like spelling tweaks or a new question being added or potentially shocker i might even change my mind on answers if i like find something else or um someone you know, can propose like, a better case yeah so um it's a living document but there you go that is there if people like it um I have a big bag of Roger Roger tokens. Oh, I still oh. I still owe Chris, a uh, guy who's cutting them for us, another 100 bucks, so I need to throw that at him. But yeah, we've got like 90 so far of our Roger Roger tokens. Very so nice. We, we should have enough to last. Uh, so they've been out on the table. And uh, yeah. They've been times. spotted in the wild, you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all the patrons will uh, be chugging away towards getting those and I'll send them out. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I don't know. Anything else that you think I missed? No, or? no I think you covered everything. Uh, I do also want to note that I, I on again, I'm only going to mention it briefly, on my other YouTube channel where I cover MTG Arena, I'd mention, I had a um, the last video I did before I went to San Diego, I'd mentioned how, to, how do I make my channel better? What do you guys want to do? We covered a whole bunch of things like format and stuff like that. And I mentioned other games. Um, we are slowly creeping towards November. There is a huge amount of interest on the Alien RPG. So I don't know if you have anyone there local. I would think that we would want to do something over Skype where we everyone could have an individual camera if we're going to able to do it. I know we originally debated doing it with my kids at home and having it wrapped around the table. I think the logistics behind that's probably a little difficult to pull off. Um, so I think I might just play a private campaign at home with the kids and then kind of keep one that we're going to put up on the channel over there. I was hoping to kind of enlist you, and I don't know if there's anyone who is watching or listening, or if Chris may know anyone who would be interested in doing uh, the Alien RPG, but I think the requirements would be simple, Skype and a, and a camera and a halfway decent mic. Um, I'd be interested in getting maybe four or five players together to kind of do some fun stuff. I was hoping Chris would produce. I'm hitting him with this right now. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've got ideas on how we could make that work, but we should be, uh, should be good. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. So the game comes out in November. Uh, I'll have uh, I think I know you've got yours coming. Um, the other thing on that uh, on that same show, someone said, "Oh, I heard you talk about X Men once or twice." I have kicked at least four people from my YouTube channel for Magic over to the show. So if you're seeing me now here for the first time, hi, thanks for coming and joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Yeah, uh, I should say obviously for the YouTube viewers as well. Sorry, content has been a little bit lackluster and delayed as you can maybe see like behind me there are no longer a giant pile of boxes on the table and, <laughs> um i've actually spent time getting the basement back how it should be again we had a game night last night and played had friends over for joe's birthday and drank some wine and played some board games down in the basement uh -huh. but like it's all done i had to buy another calax unit and it's like already full but I couldn't, I was trying to rotate what was out and what was, and I didn't have a room and it was making me like unmotivated to record because I wanted to record stuff on the table and I couldn't because it was filled with garbage. So I've, I'm ready to theoretically start pumping out better content again. So I need to revisit D and D player journals. I need to hit Greg up so I can record another, um, that's initiative episode because we've, we've, been like a month now without recording just because stuff happened at work where i've been mega busy trying to deal with suppliers who sent us a four grand order that i didn't ask for so uh, lovely fun times and probably yeah. build you for it oh yeah we paid for it it's good Thanks, so guys, uh, luckily it. the sentry box is a big enough store that a four grand order like isn't going to like bankrupt us it it's annoying, but it's not the end of the world. But that kind of stuff happens to a normal game store. Like, <laughs> there's not a lot they can do. Like, um, I can't afford to pay for this, and I didn't ask for it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. So, um, reestablishing relationships with um, 
some of our reps and uh, people has been happening over the last few weeks, but it did involve me working like 26 hours over a two, two, two or three day period of which Jill was working. So I could only do that at night time. So I was looking after the baby. Oh, toddler now, she's nearly two. I looking was going to say Evie. now. Yeah. Looking after Evie in the day and going to work, trying to deal with this and trying to schedule phone calls to have conference calls with people about what was going on. And I've got like pages of inventory to like go through. But You're one of those guys that brings work home with you. Look at that. <laughs> I, I work in a game store pushing toy soldiers around and I still bring my work home with me. That's commitment. That is, that's commitment. All right. So I think that's what we're going to button up. Chris, always a pleasure talking to you. Um, we will be back to a regular ordinary every two week recording schedule starting this week i promise yeah. we uh, might even get to... sean back too sean almost made the thursday show if we would have recorded he said he was feeling yeah. up for it that day but unfortunately had to bow out i bowed yeah. out that i mean the whole thing kind of fell apart so he's on the verge of returning to the show um i actually yeah. spoke to chad chad's also on the verge of returning so pretty soon we might have the whole cast back together where we belong that'll be nice it will be nice so yeah. anyway, always good talking to you and hanging out with you, my friend. Oh, it's good to be here, Ed. Thanks for uh, making this happen again. It's been good. <laughs> Didn't want to drop off too far. So, all <laughs> right, guys, um, we'll catch you in the next episode. I'm not even sure what we're going to cover, but we'll we'll come up with something fun to discuss in the meantime. So until next episode, guys, fly casual. Thank you once again for joining the Lack of Focus X-Wing podcast. Check out Dice Hate Productions for all the latest episodes, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you again next episode.